Hello, welcome to Investing with Ellen. Today we are going to talk about market crashes and how bad they really are. I have done so much research and calculations on this topic and hopefully the findings and analysis will be useful for you to um, help you make better informed investment decisions. So without further ado, let's get started. My first very fundamental question about market crashes is, does anybody really know why, what causes market crashes? And the answer is no. <laughs> According to my research online, there are either a lot of answers as to why market crashed, which shows uncertainty, or there are always a lot of debates um, amongst economists as to why market crashed. But the truth is nobody really knows why. I think market crashes is obviously within the domain of economics. And economics is a study of human behavior in the financial context. And to me, it is like the subject of politics and psychology it's more of an art than science. There is never a black and white answer. Findings are always open to interpretations. Therefore, to this day, we are still learning about what's behind the market forces that's driving human behavior and therefore driving asset prices. Let's look at the Great Depression of 1929. It was the biggest stock market decline in history. The Dow plunged 89% over the course of 34 months. However, the economists are still yet to reach a consensus as to exactly what caused this market crash. And the same goes for the Black Monday crash in 1987. Many explanations have been offered as to what caused the Black Monday, which is also another sign that um, there isn't any certainty as to exactly why. Even looking at the most recent crash, which coincided with the COVID-19 outburst, was it really the pandemic that caused the sudden market crash? Or was it at least partially caused by the building up of the anxiety amongst investors about the longest running bull market ever, and therefore a pullback um, or even crash must be coming at some point. So to me, market crashes are often a self-fulfilling prophecy because the market is driven by human behavior, it's driven by investors. So when the investors are nervous, the market is nervous. When the investors and market's tension is high, any small trigger could easily break the balance and suddenly everybody's selling. Which is why it's making me slightly nervous right now because it feels like there is a lot of tension in the market and has been for a few years and the stock markets just carry on going up and then has been more and more concerning voices that I, I can read and see online about um, an imminent market crash. And at the same time, the strange thing is, there is also a somewhat frenzy-like trend in trading in stocks. I'm not even saying investing because it feels more like an opportunistic trend at the moment that encourages men and women on the street to put their money into investment so that they can make some quick money, which is not the right mindset to have as an investor. The other day I logged into my Hargrave Lansdowne ISA account. The first thing I saw was a um, suggested article about the differences between speculators and investors. This has never happened in the um, Hargrave Lansdowne app before and it seems to me that when uh, a large investment um, slash trading platform feels the need to prompt users to read such reminders or even warning. It's the sign that there are some causes for concern in the recent market activities. And really the moral of the story is that 
nobody really knows what causes market crashes and when the market is going to crash. There is so much uncertainty out there. Policymakers don't know, economists don't know, investors don't know. There is just not a crystal ball that would tell anybody when the next market crash will come. During the South Sea bubble of 1720, Newton once famously said, I can calculate the motion of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. It goes to show that as far back as the 18th century, some of the greatest minds on earth had realized what an impossible task it is to try to predict what human beings will all decide to do at the same time next. And it's safe to say that nothing has changed much since. It's the same as the toilet paper shortage during the early days of the pandemic and lockdown. Who would have thought that would happen? So it's best to keep in mind the old saying that the market is going to do what it is going to do. Therefore, as investors, the best we can do is to prepare ourselves mentally and financially so that we not only won't be devastated by market crashes, but we can even benefit from it. So how long does it really take the market to recover following a crash? Let's look at some examples. Here is a table I prepared of the market crashes of the last century and their recovery time. As you can see, the worst recovery time was the Great Depression of 1929. It took the Dow a quarter of a century to recover, losing 89% of its value from the peak. And that was a pretty long wait. Although the Great Depression of 1929 seems pretty scary, I think it was a very different era back then. There was much less regulation in the securities market and a greater information as well as power disparity between the people and the state as well as big institutions. Furthermore, fundamental analysis did not really emerge until after the Great Depression, which is really key to picking out great businesses with solid books and great management team and great ethical values that are really worth investing in. And finally, the World War II probably didn't help to speed up the economic recovery either. Looking at Black Monday in 1987, SP500 took one and a half months to reach its bottom and then another year to recover. Whereas Nasdaq 100, also my favorite, took only seven days to reach its bottom, losing nearly 30% of its value, and then about seven months for its recovery. Not bad. Looking at the dot-com bubble, which is a lot more recent, in March 2000, this time SP500 and Nasdaq 100 took about the same time, i.e. two and a half years to reach its bottom. There was quite a big gap in recovery time, mainly because Nasdaq 100 is tech heavy and the dot-com bubble really hit the um, internet companies the hardest. I do think that the dot-com bubble was kind of a unique case because there was a lot of irresponsible behavior manipulation on the part of the investment banks that caused the dot-com bubble. A lot of businesses that were listed on the stock market at the time were completely illegit. They were not making any money at all from a documentary I watched a while ago, which I will include a link in the description. There was a business owner who said he was approached by investment bankers at the time to take his company public and um, at the time when he'd only just rented out an empty office and contemplating whether to buy furniture or not. There were a lot of empty shell companies uh, on the stock market that took a lot of money from investors and then completely wiped out during the dot-com bubble. That's why it took such a long time for the market to recoup its losses. And I do think crashes caused by fraud are the hardest to recover. 
because if a company is fraudulent and it gets found out, its value usually goes to zero. There is no recovery. That's different from legitimate businesses with a good management team and promising market shares being impacted temporarily by market panic and anxiety. The financial crisis of 2008 took only five months to reach the bottom of its valuation and SP500 took one and a half year to recover and Nasdaq 100 took less than a year. COVID-19 crash took one month to reach the bottom, albeit both indices lost 34% and 28% respectively. SP500 took only six months to recover its losses, whereas Nasdaq 100 took three months only. I want to take a bit of time to just touch upon the Japanese market crash, which was the only crash that has never recovered yet. So the Japanese asset price bubble, which um, burst in 1990, it took nearly 22 years for the stock market to reach the bottom, during which time two other crashes of the 2000s also happened and prolonged the situation. As a result, the Japanese stock market never reached its pre-crash price level. As of February 2021, the Japanese stock market index Nikkei 225 remains 25.18% down from its peak in 1989. Although it's quite an exceptional case, as there are lots of factors that prevented the Japanese market from recovering, including its population composite, the political environment, as well as the characteristics of local culture and people's mindset. So looking at the Black Monday of 1987, financial crisis of 2008, as well as the coronavirus um, market crash in 2020, they are really not difficult crashes to sit through. They range between three months and one and a half years for the market to fully recover. That shouldn't be very difficult for investors to sit through, especially if um, they have been keeping enough money aside for their living expenses and part of their portfolio in low risk assets, or even some money set aside to take advantage of market dips then crashes actually present great opportunities for you. The next question I had for myself was, what if I invested in only good companies with promising futures in terms of their business growth? What if I invested in those companies? Would they be hit as hard during the market crash? Would they lose less and recover faster? Let's look at some examples. So I have chosen Amazon, eBay, Intel and Oracle as four businesses that were operating before the market crash of 2000 and still remain a going concern to this day. And let's look at how they did in comparison to the indices after the market crash. As you can see, eBay was definitely a winner during the dot-com bubble of 2000, taking only eight months and 23 days to reach the bottom of its valuation in comparison to others that took around two years and two years and a half. And eBay also had a really impressive recovery time of three years and eight months and 22 days only, which is much, much less than the um, second best recovery time, which was the SP500 of seven years and two months and three days. However, it looks like eBay is an exception because a great business like Amazon also took nine years and 10 months to recoup its losses, which you may have noticed would have been after another crash, i.e. the financial crisis 2008. Another takeaway from the table is Intel. 
it is still recovering from the coronavirus crash of 2020 and it is the only one on the table that has not fully recovered even though the wider market had recovered within months of the crash so looking at the data in general it seems like individual stocks tend to take about the same time as the market or the relevant sector to recover its losses and sometimes a stock can take significantly longer to recover the losses such as in the case of intel regardless of how well run and resilient the business had been and other times a truly exceptional stock such as eBay or Amazon could really far exceed the market in terms of its recovery time as well as the stock's growth after the crash. However, picking winning stocks like this takes a lot of careful research, conviction, skill, as well as equally, if not more importantly, luck. Next, let's have a look at the strategy of doing nothing. If you had put your money into any of the stocks I mentioned, as well as the market at their peak prices and held on to your position ever since, how well would your investment have done? So if you had invested before the dot-com bubble burst and held your investment to date, here are your returns as of the 25th of February 2021. They don't look too bad at all. All of them have uh, delivered positive returns. And in the case of Amazon, it's almost like winning the lottery. However, you may have noticed that you would have been better off holding index funds, tracking either the SP500 or NASDAQ 100 indices than if you held Intel or Oracle stocks. Next, the financial crisis of 2008. Here are the returns as of 25th of February 2021 if you had invested right before the crash in 2008 and stayed invested since. These are even better returns. Although it does mean that at the time of the financial crisis, the market and the sampled stocks either were still recovering from the 2000 crash or had declined again since their recovery. So between the dot-com bubble and the financial crisis, you could have been better off holding cash. That is unfortunately the very depressing nature of bear markets and why a lot of investors struggle to stay invested throughout the whole time because it is just hard looking at your investment account in the red and stay there for nearly a decade. Finally, let's look at the COVID-19 crash. So these are the returns you would have had one year on. With the exception of Intel, all the others have delivered positive returns and some very good returns on NASDAQ 100, eBay, as well as Amazon. What I have really learned from doing this research is that First of all, there is really nothing we can do about market crashes. They will come and there's no way to predict what time, how bad it is and how long it is going to be. However, it has almost always recovered. Therefore, as long as you find a way to enable yourself to stay calm and have the time and capacity to sit through the bad times, market crashes are really not that bad. The second thing I've learned is that quality stocks with a solid business behind it can outperform the market by a big margin sometimes. However, whether you have chosen such a stock that stands the test of time will not be clear to you until it has proven so. So that is the tricky thing in stock investing. You never quite know whether you are holding a winner until it proves to be a winner. All that we can do is lots of research. However, there is always the role of luck and the invisible force of the markets that are completely outside of our control. 
so to reduce your chance of losing money badly during market crashes. I would say the most important thing is to build a portfolio that enables you to stay calm during the chaotic times. And how would you do that is really a, a subjective decision. Personally, I'm constantly assessing how I would feel if a portion of my portfolio evaporates because that assessment helps me um, check in with myself as to how comfortable I am with the current risk my portfolio is taking. For example, recently I sold some of my leveraged holdings because I feel like it, it was taken up too big a portion of my portfolio um, and leveraged products tend to do really, really badly and almost never recover if a really bad market crash happens. Because of the building up of, of the tension in the market recently and the sense that the next market crash is imminent, I don't feel as bold as I was previously, um, say a year or two ago. My three tips to help you stay calm during market chaos. First, stay well informed. Two, detach from money. Three, have other income streams. Stay well informed is really important. Um, for me, I love reading and watching other people's opinions and interpretations of the market activities and where it is going to go next. It helps me stay on top of the trends in the market and make sound judgment as to where I want to put my bet next um, and what kind of investment um, products there are that helps me improve my portfolio and better manage risks and returns. And to stay well informed, I'm not just talking about market news and um, sharing of opinions, but also good investment books. There are lots of well-written books by professional, successful investors out there, uh, which I'll put a list in the description down below. If you're interested, feel free to check them out. By detaching from money, what I mean is not to associate your sense of self-worth or self-value to how much money you have or how much money you've made in your investment portfolio. Because the market is changing constantly. Yesterday, you could be making 100% returns. Then the next day, the market could crash and your, uh, you could be losing half your money, if not more. So if you attach your sense of self-worth and how intelligent you are, how good an investor you are, directly to how much money you are making at this given moment, you are bound to be emotionally distressed and even devastated by any losses that the market delivers completely out of your control. So to stay calm and stay emotionally balanced and continue to make wise decisions in the investment market and even take advantage of market downturns, you really do need to detach from the outcome. So I would encourage you to think about what investing means to you. What does it offer you that's beyond money itself? Um, for example, to me, investing itself is a very interesting and intellectually rewarding venture for me. And I get to talk about it with other people, constantly learn about what the world is up to because the world trend is very much part and parcel of the investment world. So I get a sense that I'm, I'm staying on top of what is going on around me or even very far away from me. So I definitely get much more of a reward through investing than the, the monetary return itself, which is what keeps me safe and um, enables me to see market downturns as a learning opportunity. And you may also get other forms of rewards from investing beyond money itself. If you care to share what that is for you, I'd love to hear about it down below in the comment section. 
finally, it's kind of a no-brainer. Having other income stream is very important for staying calm during market crashes. Because if you are reliant on the money you have invested for your living expenses, then naturally you are not going to be able to stay very calm. But if you either have savings set aside to cover a lengthy period that either enables you to wait for the market to recover or to um, find a job or even create additional income streams, then you would be able to um, reduce your anxiety and stay put in the market. And having other income stream also enables you to take advantage of the discount market crashes offer and further invest into the market in the hope of getting bigger returns years down the line. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel for all my future updates. I upload videos regularly on the subject of investing. I'll see you at the next video. Bye everybody!